Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, my name is Mark Patton. Uh, I'm an advisor here on uh, INCAN. I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, I'm a survivor of 28 years, and first things first, the bathrooms are down the hall and to the right. Um, <laughs> I'm pleased uh, to welcome Dr. Eugene Waltrin and uh, Thomas Odoricio. Dr. Waltrin, take it away. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Most of the stuff that I have today, uh, you may have seen in years gone by. Most of it was plagiarized from Dr. Odoricio. Uh, this is uh, our current population of patients in New Orleans. We now have over 3,000 neuroendocrine tumor patients that we've seen over time. You can see that about 12% are in the pancreas. The biggest part will be what Dr. Odoricio talks about, which is the neuroendocrine tumors of the small bowel. The nice part about the pancreas is that 80% of people uh, are non-functional, but the 20% of people that are functional have very specific markers and they have a disease process that you can track. The islets of Langerhans are what are found in the pancreas. They have uh, a bunch of cells surrounded by other cells that make pancreatic enzymes, etc. Neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas are mostly non-functional, but when they are functional, they secrete a primary peptide like insulin from an insulinoma, gastrin from a gastrinoma, and they can also hypersecrete multiple secondary peptides. Primary and secondary peptides can interact, they can augment, negate, or induce new symptoms, and you can provoke and suppress these things. It's sort of like an artist and a palate. The artist takes the primary peptide color and puts it in the middle, and then he takes dabs of all these other peptides that can be hypersecreted and or suppress the, the primary peptide over time. The majority of peanuts are non-functional, 80%. The 20% are named by the peptide that they hypersecrete. And remember, it is not, I repeat, not, 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 what the pathologist says on a stain, that this tumor stains for insulin. That doesn't make you have an insulinoma. It has to be insulin in your blood. So, oops, excuse me, hit the wrong button. Uh, the insulinomas, gastrinomas, vipomas, pancreatic polypeptide, glucagonomas, somatostatinomas, and the latest one on the, the forefront is something called a grelinoma. I saw my second grelinoma after 30 years in clinic this last week. There are four types of actions of the peptides that neuroendocrine tumors secrete. They can work through what's called an endocrine action, a paracrine action, a neurocrine action, or Dr. Odoricio's favorite, what's called an intracrine action, and I'll tell you about that later. The term endocrine means you make the peptide one place and it has an action at another place. In other words, oops, hit the wrong one. If you have the, a pancreatic islet cell that makes insulin, it's made in the pancreas but acts at a distal site like the muscle. Paracrine is uh, uh, next door neighbors talking to one another. And if you look again, here are the, the same drawing, an islet here may contain an alpha cell that makes glucagon, a delta cell that makes somatostatin, a beta cell that makes insulin, and a PP or K cell that makes pancreatic polypeptide. And somatostatin in this islet here controls the as other peptides by knocking on its neighbor's door and bringing chicken soup. 
Neurocrine actions of a peptide are much like the word implies, nerve, neurocrine, whereas you have a peptide that is a local event and you secrete the peptide, it diffuses across a small neurosynaptic cleft and it works on a different cell downstream. And let's look here, you can see that you have a nerve fiber, it secretes the peptide, it goes downstream where like if it's VIP and it's working through this neurocrine synaptic cleft, it can control uh, the uh, motility and control the, uh, the secretion of fluid from the small bowel. And then there's the newest thing that's not well written up and not well understood. And Dr. Odoricio, who for those of you who don't know, is a very devout man. And uh, he explained how intracrine actions work. And that is that uh, the, the cell makes a peptide. It's uh, secreted out of the cell. It turns around and makes a U-turn and comes right back to the receptor that it then alternates uh, its actions and translocates to the nucleus. When I was questioning Dr. Odo about this, he said it's how, how God affirms that masturbation is okay. He said it, I didn't. The first neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas that was described was described in the early 20s and 30s by Banting and Best. They took tons, literally tons, of pork uh, and beef pancreas and they put it over giant columns and isolated a milligram of insulin out of like a ton of pancreas. In 22, uh, Fletcher showed that insulin causes hypoglycemia. Later in the 20s, they found that insulinomas, tumors of the pancreas, the vast majority of which are benign, cause symptoms of hypoglycemia. And it was the famous Dr. Whipple who described a triple uh, group of, of, of symptoms, a triad of symptoms, and the the uh, tumors uh, that make insulin are balanced out by things like glucagon, growth hormone, and GIP. Uh, and it's like a teeter-totter. And, and this is how you have to think about every peptide's action. That for every action, i.e. insulin takes your blood sugar and lowers it, Things like dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, the stress amines raise your blood sugar, fight or flight. Glucagon, again, released from the, uh, the, the uh, liver when you're in trouble as a big blast of sugar then comes out. And growth hormone and GIP, etc. Whipple's triad are how we diagnose people with insulinomas. They, it is the symptoms of excess insulin or low blood sugar with fasting. You fast these people with an IV of just plain saline, no sugar in it for 72 hours. And eventually, for those people who hypersecrete insulin, their fasting blood sugars bring their blood sugar down to less than 50 percent. Uh, uh, and when you then see these, you draw an insulin, pro-insulin, and all these fancy blood tests, and then you give them the glucose. You don't do it until you do the, uh, uh, you've given the, uh, the glucose, but you have uh, the, uh, um, anyhow, uh, insulinomas, the symptoms that you get with inf insulinomas are confusion, dizziness, weakness, blurred vision, 
and you get peripheral signs like sweating, tremors, palpitation, hunger, and obesity. People who have insulinomas try to out eat their tumor, and you can't. You can get fat, but you can't out eat the secretion, hypersecretion of insulin. The diagnosis, again, the 72 hour fast is the key. You measure glucose, insulin, pro insulin, and C peptide, and then you give the, the glucose. Octrea scans are not very helpful. Of all the neuroendocrine tumors, insulinomers are least likely to show up on Octrea scans or gallium scans. Gallium scans have been so new that we don't have the years of experience that we do with Octrea scan, but I've never seen a gallium scan light up positive for a benign insulinoma. And you have to make sure that the people who that you think have an insulinoma are indeed are not malingering. They can use uh, oral antihyperglycemics, uh, things like metformin, et cetera, or can actually use uh, intravenous forms of drugs that will lower your blood sugar. Treatment is surgery, surgery, surgery. If you have metastatic disease, diazoxide, chemotherapy, somatostatin analog therapy, and the newest therapy being PRRT. Gastrin producing tumors are the second most common neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. They are Dr. Odo and I trained at Ohio State where Dr. Robert Zollinger was the chairman and where he discovered the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome in the early 1950s. He found that these people had severe recurrent ulcer disease. Even if they had good ulcer operations, uh, they had uh, ulcers that went down into their small bowel they made so much acid. They may make 1,200, 1,500 mLs a day of acid. That is the important thing. If I put you on PPIs and you can't make any acid in your stomach at all, your body tries to, to make acid and by making gastrin. You must have acid in your stomach to have a Zollinger-Ellison syndrome or gastrinoma. The fact that you have elevated gastrin by itself without acid or in the case of what we call achlorhydria, lack of acid um, is you have to have the acid. That's the take home message. And this is Dr. Z whoops, this is Dr. Zollinger and his compatriot, Dr. Ed Ellison, uh, whose son went on to be the Zollinger Professor of Surgery and Chief of Surgery at Ohio State for many years. This is what, where you find a gastronoma. It's in what's called the gastronoma triangle, which is where the cystic duct from the gallbladder meets the common duct, the C lateral C-sweep of the duodenum, and the superior mesenteric artery. To control acid, the key peptides are gastrin, uh, raising your acid, VIP and somatostatin decreasing your acid, and you can bet there's a, a uh, teeter-totter here as well. Again, gastrin raises your acid, you have something that balances it out, secretin, somatostatin, and VIP. And these uh, are all critical components. And we manage our, our acid in our stomach minute to minute, day to day. And this is a confused, uh, fusing slide. But what I would like to show you real quick is this is how complex gastric physiology is. Oops, hit the wrong one again. Again, the D cell makes somatostatin. That goes to the uh, enterochromaffin cell that makes histamine. It also goes to the G cell that makes gastrin. And it affects the parietal cell directly that makes the acid. Gastronomas, it's, uh, it's very easy to mistake high gastrin levels, which are associated with conditions that don't have hypersecretion of, of acid. 
Vipomas are less common than insulinomas or gastronomas. It is the, usually the secretion of VIP from an islet cell tumor of the, the stomach or, or the uh, uh, sympathetic chain or the pancreas. Uh, it's associated with high gastric pH or lack of acid in the stomach, bone reabsorption, elevated serum calcium levels, but they, it's different because they don't have parathyroid hormone hypersecretion and massive loss of liters of tea-colored stool a day with very high levels of potassium and bicarbonate. These people have liters and liters of diarrhea a day. Dr. Odoricio was the first person to show that octreotide would control this very rapidly. And you can see this is from one of Dr. Odoricio's papers. This patient was making like 1,200 cc's of stool a day, gets his first octreotide level, his VIP level drops down, gets his second level, it stabilizes. This is the stool volume, first, first injection, second injection, and this is the guy who hadn't been out of the hospital in months, now after three or four or five days has adequate control that he can go home and be with his family. This is a, a drawing by Chris Ellison from Ohio State showing that the watery diarrhea syndrome caused by Vipoma, there's lack of uh, acid in the stomach, watery diarrhea, loss of massive amounts of potassium and acidosis because of lack of, of uh, or hypersecretion of bicarbonate. Again, how do we control our gut motility? If you want to increase your motility, Modulin and VIP increase your motility. Somatostatin decreases your motility. That's how the octreotide and lanreotide work because one of their ways they work is to decrease motility. Control of secretion is the yin to motility's yang. You can say that VIP increases your secretion and decreases your absorption. Somatostatin does exactly the opposite. Glucagon is one of the most rare neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've seen three glucagonomas in my life. And it, glucagon is the peptide. The insulin stores energy. Glucagon liberates that energy from the cell in times of trouble, times of need and it's released with stress, the intestinal phase of digestion, and hypoglycemia. The three Ds of, of hyperglucagonemia are dermatitis, and I'm gonna show you that picture. Dementia, I'm not gonna show you that, uh, but, and diabetes. The diabetes is mild, the, the dementia is mild. The dermatitis is a booger. Wait until you see this. You've never seen something that looks so so tender. Areas are hyperpigmented, they ulcerate, and almost all patients with a glucagonoma die of a thrombosis of a major blood vessel. My partner in Oregon before I left was a guy named Bill Fletcher. He was the one who found that, and he found out that you can't use Coumadin, you can't use Exgeva, those kind of drugs. You have to use heparin to prevent the, these thromboses. Uh, again, just a summary of what you see. Anemia, diabetes, painful tongue, weight loss, and erythema. This is a tongue, it's beefy red, it's big, it's swollen, and it, the, my patients who I saw with glucagonoma said that it burned like somebody used a blowtorch on it. These people have ulcerations. 
when these and these are called intertriginous areas underneath the breast in the groin etc and you can see that once they start to heal they have ulcerations this is again uh, buttock here's the the intracleft here you can see the hyperpigmentation and it happens in these intertriginous areas Somatostatinomas are even rarer than glucagonomas. I've seen one somatostatinoma in my life. That's when I was at the NIH working uh, and learning from a gentleman named Dr. Murray Brennan. There are five somatostatin receptors. SST2 is the, the most common one that we will talk about. It has to do with cell growth, cell differentiation, Dr. Odoricio and I described the original role in angiogenesis and in peptide release. The actions of somatostatin are biphasic. You would think that the more somatostatin that you use, the better off you are. More is not necessarily better. And again, somatostatin binds to the somatostatin receptor. That turns on the effector, which is called a G protein, and the G protein acts through things like cyclic AMP, calcium, protein kinase C, and that regulates peptide release. Somatostatin, my patients will tell you, I tell them it's the universal off switch. It's found almost everywhere. It's found in the brain, in the hypothalamus, in the pituitary. It's found in the gut. And it's found in glands like the, uh, the pancreas. It's the pivotal peptide. It controls endocrine secretion, exocrine secretion of pancreatic enzymes that control fat, amylase, lipase, etc. It controls acid secretion, bile secretion, gut motility, and there is some indication that somatostatin and its analogs actually uh, affect pain through the opioid receptor. Uh, somatostatin, uh, uh, somatostatin omas are very hard to find. They uh, can cause gallstones. And remember, one of the things that your doctor will probably tell you uh, if you're about to have surgery for a neuroendocrine tumor is he's going to take out your gallbladder. So if they use octreotide or alanreotide, you don't develop gallstones down the road. It gives you mild diabetes. Usually, I tell people that count on your blood sugar being about 160. Steatorrhea, most common side effect of LAR or lanreotide, steatorrhea, floaty stools, smell like a dead moose, lots and lots of fat, by stock and arrowwick. Come on, guys, that was funny. Uh, and flatulence, number one, uh, they, they say you will sit on the toilet and people will leave the house. It, uh, the smell is so bad. And again, somatostatin decreases your insulin, decreases your glucagon, gives you mild diabetes, steatorrhea and malabsorption of fat, and gallstones. And uh, at that point, I think I'll turn it over to Dr. Odoricio, who will talk about the other half of neuroendocrine tumors, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, carcinoids. Where's the front? Is it in front? Okay. Back. Back. Laser. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Gene, and uh, it's a pleasure being here. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, share some uh, experiences and clinical observations and some information uh, to this group, particularly. Uh, Gene, Gene's introduction was very, very helpful because what he was really showing you was that the very same cell that's associated with the tumors in the small bowel and in the pancreas and in the lung and in the adrenal medulla, all are the same cell. They're a neuroendocrine cell. But where they reside and when they become uh, too much of a good thing, they give off uh, a different 
natural uh, peptide, neuropeptide, which uh, we describe as hormones. That's another branch of the hormone, as Gene showed, endocrine. But they don't always uh, necessarily make a substance that we've been smart enough to measure. Gene brought up a very important point. With gastrin, we knew gastrinoma. We knew what gastrin did since 1905. So when Zollinger and Ellison made the observation, he put together what the physiologist had shown in 1905 and said, this is too much of a gastrin uh, situation and found the tumor in the pancreas. With VIP, it was the finding of the diarrhea pathologically that led to the understanding of the VIP as a, as a neuromodulator, uh, hormone, if you will, when it's elevated, causing secretory diarrhea. So it was very, very helpful. I just want to back a little bit up and uh, show you why uh, what's happened in the field of neuroendocrine tumors. That graph is impossible to look at in detail, but it goes back to 1972 when the National Cancer Institute was receiving all of the cancers in the United States by uh, the number of patients from each center and what their tumors were. And they began keeping a registry which many of you may know as SEER, S-E-E-R, that's Survival Epidemiologic End Results. And that SEER data is used by several uh, people throughout the United States, Dr. James Yao, who has really uh, taken the data and shown specifically what's happened to neuroendocrine tumors uh, uh, to the to a, a high level of information, which is very helpful for us. But you can see on that figure that it goes. Make sure I hit the right button. It goes up to 6.98 cases per hundred thousand, where it started way back at one point something per hundred thousand. So the incidence, that is the number of new cases per year has risen almost 500, almost 600 percent over the years. Now do you say, oh okay, there's about how many then in the United States? There's about 17,000 new cases of neuroendocrine tumors in the United States. That's considered a very rare tumor or a rare tumor, if you will, a rare cancer. But the news that you need to take with you is the prevalence. There's an estimated over 190,000 people around the United States walking around with this. Prevalence is how many people are at any given time walking around. So you understand immediately that this is not an acute thing. This is a chronic kind of situation. And given the new modalities I'll share with you, and Gene has already shared with you the dates back, namely surgery, 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 you will see how many options you have, uh, people have who are afflicted or affected by this. That's just to show you the top line that the lung has become much more prominent in the incidence over the last, and this goes up to 2014, it covers about an eight to nine a year period of time, but uh, carcinoids of the lung have, uh, have risen in incidence, but in there, buried in one of those lines is the small bowel tumors of the, uh, of particularly the ileum, the, the one area of the small bowel where the carcinoid tumors uh, which uh, Gene showed you is, uh, is a prominent uh, uh, presenting uh, tumor in his series and in ours. You will see shortly it makes up at least 55% of all the tumors of the small bowel. That's uh, also has been rising very steadily. This is just a schema and all you see are those little red kind of cells and all I'm showing you there is that each of these organs that you know as lung, as thyroid, as pancreas and the small bowel down right in the middle, that's where these cells come to rest when we're born. Embryologically these cells just come and live there. 
So this is a whole system of cells that are throughout our body and not new cells. So this cancer, if you will, is not a new cell. It's the cell that Dr. Jean was talking about, the neuroendocrine cell. And as I told you, where they start to grow determines kind of what they make too much of. And in the case of the small bowel, it's called the enterochromaffin cell, and it makes too much serotonin. These are where the tumors are. So there's no surprise that those big circles and little circles represent the areas that commonly present with the neuroendocrine tumors. And as you can see, the largest circle is the small bowel, particularly, and now we know very well, it is the ilium. It is the end of the small bowel area where these carcinoid tumors are most commonly presenting. And it's probably no surprise because these cells are in the highest number, these endocrine cells, in that part of the small bowel. But they can occur as, as far back as just outside the stomach or in the jejunum, the second portion of the small bowel. But most often, as we will see at the end, it's very clearly the last hundred centimeters or so of the small bowel. But they can also occur and they're even more rare, they can be a neuroendocrine tumor of the thyroid. That is, where do they come from? Where is their primary source? That's what everybody needs to know. Where did your tumor arise? We know it goes to the liver, but where did it come from? Dr. Gene showed you the p tumors that come from the pancreas that give rise to these hormone secreting tumors. And that's a very important point, to find the primary tumor. And I think Dr. Gene's philosophy in, in the Neuroendocrine Center is exactly the same as ours, and Dr. Howell will represent that part of the surgical impact and the necessity for surgery at, at whenever possible later uh, this, uh, during the meeting. So that's just to show you where they're most common. 55% in the small bowel. The lung has heretofore been the second most common primary site. But as Dr. Jean showed as well, the, uh, the, the pancreas is very close second in terms of, of occurrence. That is where these patients are, uh, what they have when they present to the various centers. Now this is the cell. This is the best example of a neuroendocrine cell that I've ever seen. It was a gift from um, uh, a pathologist, Dr. Steve Qualman, that Dr. Gene and I both knew at Ohio State. But you can see a very clear center around the nucleus. And I've, I've mutated it seriously, and Gene has already mentioned it to you. But what you have on these cells, both when we're born and when these tumors, for the most part, become, or when these cells become a tumor, they keep their receptor. They keep their receptor 2, which is the somatostatin receptor, subtype 2. There are five receptors to somatostatin, and this is the one that is absolutely exploited and is probably the most important receptor on these cells. I think of it as a, as a lock. And when I draw my pictures upside down, I say this lock is a receptor. That means it's receiving something. The key that we're born with, Dr. Gene mentioned, is somatostatin. The two analogs, the two lookalikes of that are octreotide and lanreotide. That's what we have in the United States right now. They're identical almost to what God nature gave us to keep these under control, namely somatostatin. So when the key fits into the lock of this cell, this tumor, it turns down the release of the hormone so it doesn't release as much, and importantly, it blocks. It keeps the cell from growing. So it's an anti-proliferative as well. And it has a second action you can't forget, is that it blocks the action of the hormone on its target tissue. As Dr. Gene told you, a hormone goes to another tissue. In the case of serotonin, it goes to the bowel and it causes diarrhea. 
but somatostatin analogs and somatostatin block that. So it has two major actions. If you don't have the receptor, you still can get the help from it by its, its effect on the target cell to keep the diarrhea from, from uh, becoming worse. On the left side is the carcinoid uh, tumor and what it makes. It makes serotonin. Its predominant hormone is serotonin. It makes chromogranin A, and those are those little granules inside of this cell that give it its identity. It can make pancreastatin, which both Dr. Gene and I feel is a very important uh, teller of tales. It, I call it my tea leaf because it helps to know when the tumor becomes activated uh, during a course of several years. It also makes another, horm uh, another neuromodulator called neurokinin A, which Dr. Gene has shown uh, uh, bodes badly if it's over a certain level in the blood. And when you bring it back under its norm to its normal level, it doesn't bode badly anymore. On the right side is what Dr. Gene has already showed you. This same cell makes exactly those hormones in excess when it's coming from the pancreas. Gastrin insulin, VIP, somatostatin, glucagon. Those tumors with hormones make up about 30 percent of all the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Seven out of ten of the tumors from the pancreas, neuroendocrine tumors, are non-functional, probably means we're just not smart enough to identify the uh, role of what it might be making. But those are the ones that Dr. Gene was talking about from the pancreas. But that cell is remarkable because if you if you were into a neurology into neuroanatomy, you would say that almost looks like a, a nerve cell body, like Dr. Gene alluded to. And it, it, you almost think there's going to be little dendrites on the end of it. But it's a cell. It's a cell that derives from two, two embryologic tissues. Now here's a slide on the syndrome itself. I, I think syndrome is a strong word because if you look at the true carcinoid syndrome, it was described in 1948 and it was associated with severe right-sided heart disease because serotonin beats up on the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve. I call it carcinoid complex because it's a constellation. A syndrome is a constellation of symptoms. It's not a disease, it's not an identifiable, it could not even, might not even be a tumor. When you say carcinoid syndrome, you're talking about symptoms, you're not talking about a, a tumor. I mean, a, an actual diagnosis of disease. People with excess or pulsating serotonin from a, from a carcinoid tumor of the bowel may have spontaneous flushing. But the flesh is described as cool. It's not a hot flash uh, type of a, a, what you understand by a hot flash. It's turning red or it's turning splotchy. There's three or four different kind of flushes. But people may not, it's loved ones saying you're flushing again. And because they may not know they, or feel it. That happens at nighttime. And during the night, you can get cool sweats. Cool perspiration has not been described in the true syndrome. And I think it's one of the most prominent things that happen, especially during nighttime sleeping and, and activity of, your, of your, your dreams in that. That goes on throughout the night. And, and, and people will talk about feeling cold but sweating. And the other main thing is the loose stools. Loose stools associated, and I sound preachy, I, I can just hear my wife saying, there you go, self-righteous. Where is she? She's, I don't think she even came today. She, she should be here. Uh, but, it's, it's so just back me down a few octaves. But what happens with the loose stools, it's an AM bowel movement, usually solid, and then three or four loose ones before noon, believe, or one o'clock. If it, start, if it keeps going through the day, then there are other issues going on. But that, that bowel movement pattern, if you ask people how many they average when they're not taking any treatment, usually it's between four and about eight. 
It's rare that they get up to 12 to 15 bowel movements a day unless there are other issues going on. And Gene alluded to serotonin. Serotonin causes motility. Even the act of eating, and uh, uh, there's, I have a little, uh, another slide I think in there to talk about that. It's right there on the top. So exercise, emotion, excitement, ethanol, a glass of, uh, of wine will, will cause a flush almost within 15 to 20 seconds. There was, a, there was an endocrinologist from Duke University who used to wear a hat called the Carcinoid King. And what he did every year was his patients would come from all over for the day. And he would have them come in. These were all active carcinoid patients. And he would sit at a table and put a timer down in a glass, a three or four ounce glass, and pour this high expensive port wine and he'd tell the, uh, his patient to take a sip. And he would, uh, they would take a sip and promptly t flush. And he had a timer as to how long that took. The average was 20 seconds. And he called it the port wine challenge. And, uh, and, and it is because it mediates adrenaline. Anything that mediates adrenaline in your body will will trigger a release. It's just like squeezing a grape when you have a carcinoid tumor from the small bowel or from the lung. It can happen in the lung about three or four percent of the time. Okay? And there's the perspiration. Twenty percent of these folks can wheeze and um, uh, sometimes it's a symptomatic wheeze because serotonin when it pulsates, when it jumps from high to higher, causes a drop in blood pressure because it's a vasodilator. And some people will complain of hearing uh, uh, tinnitus ringing in their ears or lightheadedness. Now this is the structure, and I put it here before we talk about therapies, because this was the first drug approved, the first medication approved for carcinoid tumors, for neuroendocrine tumors. In 1989 it was approved. On the top is what God made, right there, and it's even said, God made this. And on the left side is octreotide, just a piece of this, but how similar are those ends? They're identical. On the right is lanreotide. How similar is this piece to what's, what's nature made? Now you can understand by looking at those how similar the two drugs are to what we have available to what was naturally given us. And that I want you to freeze on to know that they're identical almost. If you put them upside down, they're the same. It's just they're different companies and there's slight modifications in their, in their structure. Oops, I'm sorry. Let me see. And you, they're just slight modifications of the, of the uh, structure here and here that make them a little bit different in terms of the number of proteins that they replace. But those are virtually identical, acted, so lanreotide depot, uh, some, uh, octreotide LAR or o octreotide uh, sub-Q are identical in structure, are uh, virtually the same as somatostatin nature made. This is not complicated, it's just to show you the difference, because many of you may be on sandostatin uh, LAR, long-acting repeatable, Dr. Gene taught me that, or you might be on lanreotide depot, also called somatulin. Lanreotide depot is the red line. It's a, it has a remarkable kinetic. These darn pointers, they always shake. It's, it's, never, it's never me. It's never me. Here, let's see. So the, it, it, when you give a shot of lanreotide, it goes straight up and it goes straight across for almost 30 days. In fact, it even stacks. Dr. Gene has shown it stacks at the end of every shot. When you give a shot of octreotide LAR, you have a 24-hour peak of octreotide, and then it goes to zero for seven or eight days, and then starts to go up for the month. And repeated shots then establish the level. When you take subcutaneous octreotide, you're empowered. You have a 20-minute action, 
It peaks in 30 minutes. It stays that level for uh, uh, almost an hour. And in, it, in an hour and a half, or an, in two hours, in 120 minutes, half of it's gone. That's why if you're a heavy exerciser and you're having symptoms and you have a carcinoid, a shot of sub-Q 30 minutes before you exercise gives you durability. That's why when you go to eat or socially drink, taking a shot of subcutaneous octreotide 30 minutes before you have your drink, you have no flushing for at least two hours drinking. That's why anything you're going to do, exercise, family conflict that might really get you upset, the shot will do that. The sub-Q will do that. Not the LAR, not the depo. It doesn't do that. It has no brain. It doesn't know you need something in 30 minutes and, and versus something that's hanging in your blood for 30 days. Okay, the other nuance, I put that down. They're identical in structure. Um, the only, uh, the only uh, uh, form of the sub-Q in the United States is the octreotide sub-Q. It's also called rescue, as you know. And the kinetics of the LAR and depo are different, and I just showed you those two differences. One for the month goes straight up, the other goes straight up and then down. The LAR takes eight days to start to build up in your blood. Can't you hardly read that. Both LAR and Depo are FDA approved. Only Lanreotide is approved as an anti-proliferation drug. Octreotide LAR is approved for symptom control. Lanreotide is approved for both symptom control and as an anti-proliferative. Octreotide LAR at 30 milligrams per month, IM injection, is also an anti-proliferative. So you get the same action of anti-proliferation, which is a therapeutic effect. Because of that, it, it's a bit more pricey, lanreotide is. The actions are the same, and the, many medical oncologists prefer the lanreotide depot over the octreotide uh, uh, LAR. And the thing that Dr. Jean alluded to you get the subclinical fat malabsorption with either, and you get it all the time. So it doesn't go away. What you can take is an animal enzyme, which is uh, something like Creon or Viocase, but or you can go to the Walgreens or you can go to a GNC store and get yourself a bottle of papaya chewables. Papaya is fruit enzymes that are identical. You have to take four or five of them because they're not medicinal, but you take them immediately before you eat, and it alleviates the subclinical fat malabsorption that both octreotide and lanreotide cause. And that's because the enzymes are paralyzed with the octreotide or lanreotide when you eat. So that's the most important thing. The other thing that can happen, besides a slight bump, as Gene showed you, was a slight bump in sugar. Never seen myself. I've never seen uh, de novo, brand new diabetes mellitus. I've seen glucose intolerance. Is low thyroid function. And fatigue can be a problem with high serotonin, but it can also be a big problem when your thyroid's not working. So you should also remember to have thyroid function tests, not just the TSH, but the free T4 and the free T3, because the free T3 is the one that causes the tiredness. And that always happens with either lanreotide or uh, octreotide. Now, this is a schema we have it outside. This is how we do business, uh, which is essentially the way Dr. Gene does business, but we put it in sort of a schematic. Each one of those represent a therapeutic option. You can see octreotide here. You can see surgery there, very high up. This is for embolization to the liver. If your liver has uh, tumors in it, it's one of the therapeutics that you can use. 
this is the PRT that we're all very excited about because it's in the United States finally as of January 2018. And this is the paradigm that Dr. Jean and I pretty much believe in, and that is surgery, 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 followed by PRRT. That paradigm will be in the United States. It'll take another two to three years before that happens. The arrows go in both directions. I have a copy out there for you. And that means that if you, you have one option, you don't lose another. And that's what you need to do when you're talking about your care and your next therapeutic um, uh, uh, option that you may require that they go in both directions, that you don't lose one by doing another. This is a, a paper that just came out. I'm only going to show you one, make one point about the surgical and one point, a small point about the PRT. And uh, that'll be the end of my part for questions. And that is uh, that uh, Dr. G, uh, Dr. Jim Howe, who will be here, who you will hear today or today or tomorrow, I think a Saturday or a Friday, uh, just uh, released a paper not more than a month or two ago showing the distal, and you can insert or put prediction or predilection of small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. He's talking about the small bowel of the tumor, uh, small bowel of the ileum, the small bowel of the intestine, particularly the ileum. And he had 107 patients undergoing small bowel resection for carcinoid tumors of the small bowel. He took measurements of the bowel length, uh, tumor locations, resection length, and uh, he used a Kaplan-Meier which projected outward for uh, survival, etc. But the real point that I was going to show was that his results showed that instead of one tumor uh, that uh, everybody thought was the highest thing. In other words, when they went for a carcinoid tumor of the small bowel, it was thought that the majority of those would be a single carcinoid tumor. And he found instead that 56% of the tumors he operated in the small bowel were multicentric. That is to say, they run along chains of length of bowel. And that, that was quite a finding, because up until this paper, it was never noted to be that high. It was always thought to be a single tumor. And that has implication for when they tell you that there were more than one tumor there. Because the next slide is fairly dramatic to me. And uh, what he also then showed is that the vast majority, over 78% of the small bowel tumors were with, you could take a ruler and measure 100 centimeters from the end of the small bowel to the beginning of the big bowel and go backward 100 centimeters and find the majority of the tumors. Now this slide I don't expect anybody to see, but on the left side along this here, is the number of tumors he found for every patient, or how many fi uh, of the, fi uh, what he did was say one, one patient had 10 tumors, and that was the length of bowel that was involved in a scaled way. That arrow shows you one patient that had 127 small bowel tumors. Now, that needs to tell you that when it comes to who uh, does your surgery, that you ask carefully and look for the experience of a person like Dr. Howe, like Dr. Woldering and his group. Because what we see frequently are patients that come back five and six years later with symptoms and with all the symptoms of carcinoid tumor, and lymph nodes and tumors that were not found at the time of the initial surgery. So that's the one caveat, not being a surgeon, that, we, that I have come to know and appreciate from uh, both centers at NOLA and our center and with Dr. Howe. And this was very instructive to me. 
PRRT is peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. What is that? It's the key somatostatin analog. Receptor is the lock. Receptor 2. Radionuclide is the radioactivity that you use on it therapy. That's what PRRT is used in slang language. You hear people on the elevator. I do. I hear it in my dreams. PRT today, how's that going? You know, goes on and on. Here we go. This is, the, this is the agent, and if you'll look at it closely, it's no different than what we saw before. Here's the peptide. In this case, it's octreotide. There's this dota right there. That's a cage. Inside the cage is a radioactive material. When you put gallium on it, you have the net spot test. Gallium 68, D-O-T-A-T-O-C, or D-O-T-A-T-A-T-E, which is the net spot test. We have the Dota talk that we uh, brought in the uh, United States about six years ago at the same time as the, as the net spot was introduced. When you put when you put yttrium on it, you now have a radioactive therapeutic. It's a beta emitter, and it kills short distance. When you put lutetium-177, it's a beta emitter. It kills short distance. So when the key goes into the lock on the tumor, the short distance energy kills. Kills. And I'll show you a dramatic uh, a display of that in a moment. When you, when you, and it comes in a talk or it comes in a tate, one is octreotide, the other is octreotate. Uh, this is just a picture of the two radioactive compounds. You can see how close they are. Lanreotide are the modification, I should say, of the, uh, of the uh, octreotide in, in both cases. They're virtually the same. There's a little bit of adjustment there. The rear end of octreotide fell off and it became a, a, an amino acid down here. Shown graphically, uh, again, it's the key fitting into the lock on the tumor, and whatever you put in the cage is either diagnostic or therapeutic. This is a killing a tumor with molecular targeting. You see the yttrium, in this case it's yttrium up at the top. It's, it's going through the blood vessels, it's finding its lock. It's taken into the cell and there's an explosion that none of us hear in all directions usually. It's, a, it's an all direction target and then normally what happens that we don't see is that the cells uh, are killed. This is a cytocidal therapy. It's absolutely cell directed and every cell would technically have the receptors in the case of a neuroendocrine, and that's PRRT at its finest. This is the paper that was published in New England Journal of Medicine, Strasburg and colleagues, we were pleased to be a part of it. And on your right, and there is hard to read again, this is what happens when they were given octreotide for 60, day, 60 milligrams of octreotide against the actual PRRT. The median time of, of progression was about 28 months versus octreotide, which was eight months. So that's progression-free survival, and it, it's, um, it's held up. It's, uh, it's a, very, a very effective pro, uh, a form of therapy for neuroendocrine tumors. It's been in Europe since 1996, and we finally got it in the United States in January 24th, 19, uh, 2018. And we're very grateful to the AAA who went through the very expensive trial to show against the control, against the standard of care, namely octreotide, that it had great benefit. And you can have more than one series of PRT. You can be re-PRT'd if you have a great response or a good response to the first cycles. So what we heard were two modalities, surgery 
and PRT.